from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts now being shown all over the United States of America. We're very fortunate to have as our guest for this broadcast Dr. Richard Rahn, who has a a Ph.D. from Columbia University and an honorary doctor of laws from Pepperdine University. He's done many, many things. He was an economic advisor to uh, the first uh, President Bush in the 88 campaign. We won't hold that against him. uh, He's been involved in uh, organizations promoting capital formation. He's got a weekly column in the Washington Times, and he is the and has written books, and he's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Richard, thanks for being with us. Let's get right to it. Uh, this program will be aired uh, probably a few weeks from when we're taping it, but uh, it's quite likely that the financial mess in which the United States is currently immersed uh, will still be here, despite uh, President Obama's uh, hope that it will not be. How did we get into this mess? Well, like most economic messes, it was created basically by government. There's been a lot of talk about how greedy bankers, but bankers have always been greedy. They suddenly didn't get a whole lot greedier. But what happened was um, there was a a number of of fundamental policy errors that were made. Uh, First was by the Federal Reserve. And after the 81 recession, the Federal Reserve kept interest rates too low for too long. Now it, tell me why they were, why, why was that bad? Well, what it did, they turned out a lot more money than they should have. And um, they were, they erred on wanting to have a more rapid economic expansion. Uh, Part of the problem was they did not recognize the inflation that we were really having in the economy. The price of many goods was low because you had so many low-cost Chinese imports. So if you went to Walmart and picked up a pair of slacks or things, you noticed uh, clothing prices had dropped, and you were feeling pretty good about that. But at the same time, they were putting so much money out there that fueled the housing bubble. There were several other problems here. One was that the Congress, through the Community Reinvestment Act and other actions, had put a lot of pressure on banks to loan, make home loans to people who were really not well qualified. Uh, Every politician has always wanted to expand homes. That was regarded as a big civil rights act to give people in poor neighborhoods uh, the chance to get mortgage loans. And it's, it's true that we like to have a lot of homeowners. Homeowners tend to be more stable, and they, um, you know, if you've got a piece of property, you invest in it. It's good for civil society. It's good for economic growth. But there are a group of people who, um, because of not having adequate training, do not have steady employment, um, many young people, um, and others who really shouldn't be homeowners. They should be renters. And often these people will eventually become homeowners. But they tried to artificially push this, and they had this Community Reinvestment Act, which required banks to give loans to people who weren't well qualified. But the real big problem was the government had created two massive housing organizations, housing finance uh, companies, called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And they mainly bought mortgages, what we call in a secondary market. And so in the old days... When uh, you and I first got our first home mortgages, you know, we'd go into the bank, and the bank would, banker would want to know if we were steadily employed and if we were upright citizens. And if they were convinced we were, we'd get a mortgage, and we had to have 20% down or so. And um, this system worked quite well. Well, when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac really started expanding very, very rapidly, in the 80s and 90s. and Did then, very well for Franklin Reigns and some oh, of the yeah. other people running it. These were babies basically became corrupt government yeah. organizations. Yep. Um, they ended up going to the local banks and offering to buy the mortgage. Now, if you're a local banker 
and you know that any mortgage you issue, you can turn right around and sell it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or some of the other big uh, banks, you know, who are also uh, part of this operation, then you don't much worry about the credit worthiness. Let's say I come in to get a mortgage from you, and you're not too sure about whether I'm really credit worthy or not. But what do you really care as long as you get the fees for issuing the mortgage? So you get the mortgage. A month later, you sell it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and they combine it with a lot of other mortgages. We call these mortgage-backed securities. And then they have thousands of mortgages in them. Then they're broken into pieces, and they were sold to uh, hedge funds, banks, pension funds all over the world. Now, there's talk in the paper recently about new restrictions being placed on hedge funds. Um, what is your view of hedge funds? As a matter of fact, one of the people proposing uh, restrictions on hedge funds say that they're inherently corrupt. Well, hedge funds are... Uh, just another form of mutual fund. Okay. And uh, a lot of them do a lot of good things. Some of them don't. But to generalize about them is extremely hard because they do all different types of things. And they can add to a lot of economic efficiency. Why don't you explain uh, what a hedge fund is and how it works? A hedge fund is basically nothing more than usually they have only what we call sophisticated investors or institutional money putting together in a common pool to engage in a particular type of economic activity. And you have hedge funds that do everything. They can be financing ships. Um, they can be trading in commodities. They can be building shopping centers. Uh, they can be doing things all around the world. Where does it get the name hedge fund? Where well, the, the traditional fund was supposed to have... Um, if they took a risk, um, they were supposed to have an offsetting, uh, well, it gets complicated, an option to uh, prevent the risk. For instance, if they were at risk of mortgage or interest rates going up, they were also supposed to have uh, <clears throat> go short in some mortgage securities, so in case it did, they could go up, they would be protected. It, it's, it, these things get very complex, but... Uh, hedge fund is a now widely used generic term for basically investment funds. And you think of them as investment funds doing many different things. They try to offset the risk by basically insuring their risk. And then you get, and that's where we got a lot of the economic. Now, back to the Fed and the problem of low, excessively low interest rates uh, after 1981. <clears throat> well, what this did, because the banks then started issuing a lot of variable rate interest or mortgages, and interest rates were often down, you know, two percent, two and a half, three percent, which means that a only a moderately income person could afford a very big house if the interest rates stayed low. But the interest rates, of course, didn't stay low, and the interest rates, as they went up with these variable mortgages. They put a lot of people in a bind who couldn't actually afford the higher rates. And so the people who took these out should have known they were at risk. Some did, some didn't, or didn't fully understand the risk. A lot of people thought their incomes would rise more rapidly than they did. But you had, uh, but again, government was the fundamental problem here. It was government first putting the interest rates too low. It was these government-sponsored mortgage companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It was the Community Reinvestment Act and a whole lot of other government programs which encouraged irresponsible lending. And it was a little bit of a game of musical chairs. Before the housing bubble collapsed, there was a great deal of talk about housing bubble. Uh, I had written on it, and hundreds of other people had, and gone on various TV and radio programs to talk about at some point this is going to go bust. I remember being in Miami a few years ago, and there were something like 27 high-rise office, uh, excuse me, apartment buildings, 40 stories or more, or condo buildings, luxury condos. So you look around, and you say there's no well, way they can sell those luxury condos. And, of course, they can't. And Miami is filled with uh, hundreds of unoccupied luxury condos now. And we saw that in South Florida, Southern California, a lot of places around the country. So everybody knew it was going to happen. But 
everybody was hoped like a game of musical chairs that they wouldn't get stuck when the collapse came. And it came, and it was predictable. And a lot of these people in government now, and I think of Barney Frank and Chris Dodd and Chuck Schumer and others who were the great cheerleaders for all this, who were denied there were any problems, now they're going around pointing fingers, and they should look in the mirror. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, Richard, I'm going to ask you about the future of the dollar. Are we headed for hyperinflation? Some people talk about deflation. Uh, what is likely to happen? And uh, what are the, uh, if you were running the Fed, what would uh, be the course you would pursue or recommend? Please stay with us. Our guest is Dr. Richard Ron. We'll be back right after these messages. This is Duncan Hunter, uh, Congressman San Diego, and you know I built that border fence that we use in San Diego right now, the double fence, and I wrote the law that takes a, a fence some 700 plus miles across Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. And I just want to urge everyone, stand strong on border control, and don't, uh, don't open the door to uh, amnesty, because if you open the door to amnesty, we're going to see massive waves of folks coming into this country illegally. Uh, who, and you'll have lots of people coming in illegally expecting to catch the next amnesty and the next amnesty. We need border control, and we need to enforce existing laws. Hang in there. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable, and our guest is Dr. Richard Ron. Richard, uh, we've talked a little bit about how we got into the mess. How do we get out of it? What's going to happen? You know, the, uh, the Fed has been printing a lot of Federal Reserve notes, I owe you nothings, and uh, the value of the dollar has declined precipitously. I'm not an economist. I studied under John Kenneth Galbraith, and that validates <laughs> the fact that I'm not an economist. But, uh, but it seems to me as, as a uh, secular observer that 1973 was the turning point. Until 1973, everyone could look forward to things being a little better everywhere, every year. And then after 73, things began to go downhill. Well, not really. I mean, we okay. had the problems in 73 and during the 70s. But when Ronald Reagan came in, he actually did the right things. We, he stopped the growth in government spending. He didn't reduce it as much right. as many of us wanted, as you and I and millions of others right. wanted. But he was hobbled by the Democrat right. Congress. He did reduce those very high marginal tax rates, which were killing us. Right. And um, Which Obama was trying to put back. Yeah. And he got a regulatory handle. And so we actually, per capita incomes grew very well during the 1980s and most of the 1990s. And uh, we've actually done a better job in handling the recept recessions up to this last time. And we only had, I think it was four down quarters from 1982 until this past year in that whole period. And four quarters equals a recession? Well, the two consecutive quarters. Two. We had uh, two down quarters in 1990 when the first George Bush was president. And then we, when the second George Bush came in, he inherited a recession. People forget that Bill Clinton left the economy in a recession. It was a mild recession. And so the early part of, of late <coughs> 1980 and early part of 1981, we were in a recession. Then, we, of course, we had 9-11, slowed things down. But... Um, it was a remarkable period. Never in our country's history had we actually done as well. I met a fellow who lived in uh, Germany during the period 1921 to 23 when they had hyperinflation, when uh, they would say that you would bring your currency to the supermarket in a uh, uh, barrel, or not a barrel, but a shopping cart, and you take home your groceries in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, is there any real danger of hyperinflation in the United States? Well, uh, I would like to say no, but there is a real danger now. And let me explain. We're doing the wrong things with this recession. Um, 
what we should be doing is reducing the growth of government spending. The um, remember during the mid 19 or early 1980s, people were concerned because when Ronald Reagan was trying to get the economy going, the uh, deficit one time got up to six percent of GDP, and that, and limited, all the, that limited the growth of federal yeah, spending. And all the left was screaming about it. Well. Um, we have been running uh, deficits of under 3 percent. In fact, a year ago, it was down about 1.5 percent of GDP, quite manageable. Under 3 percent you can normally manage. This year, we'll have about 12 percent, it appears. Wow. The highest we've ever had in our nation's history. And if you look at Obama's projected deficits, um, if, if his plan, his own plan comes out, He'll add more to the national debt than had been added from George Washington through the second George Bush. Uh, clearly, you cannot go on that way. Uh, the, when this debt, people have to realize when government borrows, it either takes it from the private sector, they go out and have private savers buy government bonds. When they do that, they're taking money out of the productive private sector. I mean, if you have a choice between buying a bond, let's say in a new semiconductor company, or buying a government bond, and you char choose to buy the government bond, you're starving that new semiconductor company, which may add enormous value of capital. The other way governments can finance debt is by having the central banks, in our case the Fed, actually buy the debt. Now, the Fed has already been doing some of that. They've announced they're going to buy a lot more. Ultimately, they either have to sell that back or it's going to be up in inflation. The political pressure will be on the Fed. I mean, the Fed right now claims, oh, don't worry about inflation because when inflation starts to heat up, we will sell back all the stuff we bought to the private sector. Well, that will slow economic growth again as you're taking capital out from, you know, the private entrepreneurs who are actually building real businesses and employing real people. And so the political pressure will be on the Fed not to do that. I can just see uh, President Obama and, uh, again, Barney Frank and all these others screaming that the Fed starts to do this. So my fear is we'll have higher and higher rates of inflation. We saw that in the late 1970s and you could have a period of stagflation. Um, it is possible that this gets totally out of hand. I would hope that wiser heads would prevail and they'll stop it before it gets to that point. Uh, what people need to understand is the government debt is a lot like your own home mortgage. And with a lot of people, their first mortgage is really a burden and maybe the first home is a $200,000 home, and they have a $150,000 mortgage, and that's really difficult to go ahead and, and finance and manage. Um, but their income grows, and their income goes up, and that mortgage burden becomes less and less. And then they go out and, out and buy a new, another home. But governments are a bit the same way. The privately held debt of our national debt had been about 36 percent of GDP up to a year ago. The end of World War II was 127 percent of GDP. People forgot about that. But over the years, we paid it off through inflation, not actually paying it off. It grew in nominal terms, but in real terms, it was actually shrinking because the economy was growing so nicely. And we could manage that 36 percent of our, it was like 36 percent of our national income and it has not been overly burdensome in the last 20 years. But if you start running deficits of this size very quickly, that debt-GDP ratio will rise. And just like some of these firms who got themselves in trouble by having more debt than assets, you know, you start getting up close to 100 percent or more than 100 percent. Japanese have already gotten there. The Italians are there. Uh, this will eventually lead to huge pain because it will be costly to finance that debt. It will crowd out much of the other budget, uh, part of the budget. And typically what happens is governments pay it off through inflation. 
What is the impact of uh, our government selling debt to foreign governments? What impact does that have on us? Well, actually, um, in many ways, it's sort of beneficial. I mean, it's who gets stuck with it in a way. The uh, Chinese are beginning to worry about that. Well, the Chinese are beginning to worry about it. The Chinese have almost been forced to buy our debt because the Chinese financial system has been so weak and people don't realize what happens is, let's say you go to Walmart, you buy a pair of slacks, cotton slacks. Well, the cotton was probably grown in the U.S., shipped over to China, fabricated in slacks, and shipped back. That's good for us. It's good for the Chinese. But the Chinese, they have then have dollars. What do they do with the dollars? Well, the Chinese manufacturer has to turn it over to the Chinese banks and government or it's turned into local Chinese currency. Those dollars are then used to buy often U.S. Treasury security stock uh, bonds and bills, and that is used to back up the Chinese financial system. And so, really, the Chinese economy and the American economy are much more integrated than most people understand because they rely on our debt as their reserves for their own banking system. And um, the Chinese now are talking about diversifying that debt and trying to straight out the, straighten out their own financial system. And they've got some leaders in communist China have said the dollar ought not continue to be the reserve currency of the world. Is that idea getting anywhere? Well, it will get someplace if we start to go to high levels of inflation. The, the dollar had been uh, the world's best currency. And it has it's got its problems, but it had been better than other places. And when people say, well, the dollar is going to fall, you've got to say, fall against what? Well, now the pound is falling rapidly, and the British pound is the one that's in most trouble because they have the most mismanagement. Is the Swiss franc still doing well? Well, the Swiss franc, franc is, you know, the Swiss all the seen. Even the better than the dollar. Yeah. In fact, the Swiss government just recently had to uh, reduce the uh, value of the franc, the this, this central bank, because it was getting too strong. Surprisingly, the European Central Bank, under the Frenchman, Fiché, has actually managed the euro extremely well, much better than I think most of us anticipated. And the euro has been a strong currency in these last few years. And it's very surprising because the European economies are actually quite weak. And how long they'll be able to sustain this, I don't know, because the, the fiscal policies in many of the European countries. And, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the debtor is the slave to the lender. Mm -hmm. One can argue that uh, we've been somewhat inhibited in responding to aggressive actions by Beijing because of our reliance on their economic support. Yeah. In fact, it's... That's true, and also a bit the other way around. <laughs> They're inhibited, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's... An incredible embrace. Yeah. It's uh, accidentally a little bit what happened deliberately by integrating the German and the French economies so they yeah. couldn't declare war on each other. Yeah. And uh, it would be catastrophic for the Chinese to declare war on us. And it wouldn't be good for us to do it the other way around, I mean, economically yeah. speaking. We have to break here. Please stay with us. I wish we had additional hours because I'm learning so much listening to Dr. Ron, and I'm sure you are uh, if you're watching uh, the program. But he'll have more to say when we come back after these messages. Please stay with us. Hi, I'm United States Representative Thaddeus McCotter from Michigan's 11th Congressional District. As we enter a new millennium of hope and peril, with so many problems besetting our country and yet so many opportunities before us, it is oftentimes tempting to think that your voice doesn't matter. What can one person do to make a difference in the life of their community and their country? Well, the first thing you can do is to contact your legislator. You are one of the sovereign citizens of the United States. You elect your servants to work for you in Congress. Let them know what you think. Send them a letter, send them an email, call them on the phone. Your voice matters, because if you don't raise your voice in the interests of our free republic, who will?
Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. Richard Ron, if you were President of the United States, what policies would you pursue to get us out of this mess? Well, first we know there are many impediments in U.S. government policy to economic growth. One, tax rates are way too high on capital. So you need to further reduce the capital gains tax rate. Uh, the, our corporate profits tax has made us internationally non-competitive. We have the highest corporate profits tax in the world, about 40 percent. Ireland's at 12 and a half percent. A number of European countries are down to 10 Even the Russians have been cutting taxes. Yeah, they're at 13 yeah. percent. We can't compete with that kind of tax rate. We also need to reduce those high marginal tax rates on labor. We need to get rid of a lot of the regulatory impediments. People say we haven't regulated enough. Actually, we've done perverse regulation. And um, if we had done the correct types of regulation, we wouldn't be in the, in the current problem. So we, as strange as it may seem now, we need to actually do more deregulation. And the key thing is to get down government spending because every time the government misspends one of your dollars, it weakens the U.S. And uh, I know the president's budget with all the earmarks in there had things like for tattoo removal. Well, think if a dollar is taken out of your pocket to do tattoo removal rather than putting it into, again, a new semiconductor plant, are we worse off or better off? We're better off having had you on the program. Thanks for staying with us and watching Conservative Roundtable. I hope you'll be with us next time. And many thanks to Dr. Richard Ron. 